Hi there guys, um, welcome to the first uh, in my series of skill videos. Um, in this one we'll be demonstrating an airway assessment and the positioning of a patient for uh, airway management. So, why do we perform an airway assessment? Um, I guess you, you will unconsciously perform an airway assessment on all your patients during your primary survey. But this specific approach to airway assessment um, is for the patients who you're intending to intubate or who you are considering intubating. And the purpose of this particular approach that I'm going to go over um, is to allow us to predict and, and to prepare for any difficulties we may face uh, when we're attempting to intubate this person. It also allows us to uh, gauge the likelihood of failing our intubation and it can help us to determine whether um, intubation can be safely attempted in the pre-hospital environment or whether it should be delayed into the patients in, in the safety of a hospital. So we'll be using the LEMON tool um, to facilitate our airway assessment. Um, and briefly, this involves looking at the head and the neck, um, as well as a, the patient generally, for any perceivable impediments to intubation or ventilation. Um, we'll be eva evaluating the ana anatomical dimensions of the mouth, the oropharynx and the larynx using the 332 rule, which we'll go over. Um, we'll conduct a Mallon Paddy score, which um, should give us an indication as to uh, the view that we might expect to see during laryngoscopy. Um, determining the presence of obstructions, um, any physical obstructions to the airway, and assessing the mobility of the neck, which will um, determine whether the intubator is able to manipulate that neck to get a, a better view during laryngoscopy. So, here we have Millie. Millie is six years old and uh, for the purpose of the exercise she's been involved in a residential structure fire which started when her older brother's PlayStation overheated from him playing too much Fortnite. He's the young man living his best life. Millie's not overtly injured but is complaining that she's breathed in some very hot smoke and that her throat is sore. So he obviously has some concerns that Millie may have uh, an airway burn um, that may require RSI at some point to protect that airway. Um, before it gets to that point, it's probably beneficial to assess her while she's awake. Um, the lemon tool is good for that. Uh, it's not as handy for people who are unconscious, but we can still use it for those people as well. So looking at Millie, um, it's clear that she's alert and she's fairly under stress. Um, she's not obese, she has no uh, gross deformity to her face, and she doesn't have any facial hair for us to worry about. Uh, looking at her face, head and neck, uh, there are no burns to her skin, but we can see some, some soot around her nares, which might indicate a nasal airway burn. Um, she has no scars to her neck, which might indicate a previous surgery and per perhaps some uh, obstruction when we try to advance her tube. Um, given her age at six years old, it's very likely that she will have some wobbly teeth as the incisors tend to drop at, at that age. From the side, we'll look at the occiput uh, and the angle of the neck. This is particularly important in younger kids, um, not so much in the older ones, um, but it will give you an indication with older people uh, whether the neck is kyphotic. Uh, and we'll Note that Millie has quite a significant overbite. So at a quick first glance, uh, we've already identified a few potential impediments to intubation here with Millie. Um, and now we'll move on to assess the dimensions of Millie's airway so that we can gauge an idea of the angles that we'll have to negotiate, um, as well as the physical space that we'll have to play with during laryngoscopy. Now we use the uh, 332 rule to do this. Firstly, we'll take three of the patient's fingers and we'll place them inside the patient's mouth um, between their top and bottom incisors. And this will give us an indication of, of how wide they can physically open their mouth. Yeah, a child like Millie might find that tricky. Um, we might choose to reference from our own fingers um, or with someone who is unconscious, we might just make a visual assessment Secondly, we'll measure from the tip of Millie's chin, or the mentum, to the hyoid bone. Um, and this gives us an indication of the, the depth of her oropharynx. And that should be three of the patient's fingers as well, or whatever reference you've, 
uh, decided to use. And thirdly, we'll measure from the hyoid to the thyroid, which should give us an indication of the, the length of the larynx. That should be two of the patient's fingers. So despite Millie's overbite, we don't seem to have any issues with the anatomical dimensions of her airway. Um, we'll now try to predict what view we might achieve under laryngoscopy, and we'll use the Mal and Paddy assessment to gauge this. The Mal and Paddy assessment is performed with the patient sitting upright. Um, their mouth is open and their tongue is protruded. The, uh, the view is graded from one to four, one being the best, and it's based on the structures that are visible just with a light. Um, obviously the better the Mal and Paddy score, so the, the better the grade, the, the better the predicted view during laryngoscopy. So in Millie's case, uh, she briefly displayed a grade one Mal and Paddy, but the majority of the time her view was either grade three or grade four as, as she was more relaxed. At this point, it's also worth um, adding a test of mandibular protrusion or jaw protrusion. Um, as this uh, combined with the Mal and Paddy score and the presence of snoring um, when patients sleeping um, can give you a, quite a good indication of the difficulty that you might have with bag valve mask ventilation. And here we see Millie uh, still has an overbite even though she's fully protruding her mandible. And I happen to know from personal experience that she snores as well. So she may present a bit of a challenge uh, just with bag valve um, ventilation alone. Next, we'll assess the airway for any obstruction. Um, in Millie's case, we're concerned about an airway burn. So auscultating for strider uh, is probably the most appropriate way. In an unconscious patient, um, you might again check for vomitus uh, around the mouth or in the mouth and suction that as needed. The final part of our airway assessment is to check the mobility of the patient's neck. Um, and we do this so that we can get an idea of how well we're going to be able to manipulate that patient during laryngoscopy. Uh, we can either do that by getting the patient to move their head up and down or side to side if you choose or if they're unconscious, we can manually manipulate their, their neck ourselves. That completes our lemon airway assessment, and we've actually identified a, a number of issues um, which may cause us some concern when we're attempting to intubate Millie. Um, probably the biggest one being the difficulty that we might find in using the bag valve mask. Um, but since we're aware of that, we can prepare and we can be ready for, for that should it eventuate. Alright, despite the issues that we've identified during our lemon assessment, we've decided that we can't wait and we're going to have to intubate Millie. Uh, so we're now going to move on with looking at how we can position her in order to maximise our chance of success on our first attempt at intubation. Successful intubation is best achieved with good visualisation. And the best way to optimize your visualization is by positioning your patient in such a way that best aligns their three airway axes. Um, those being the axis of the mouth, the pharyngeal axis, and the laryngeal axis. We wanna bring those axes as close to alignment as we possibly can. We can see that when someone's placed supine on a bed or on a hard surface, that their three airway axes don't line up very well. Um, and they require some degree of head lift and head tilt to sort of bring those axes closer together. We achieve that by um, lifting the patient's head up into a sniffing position and um, potentially ramping the patient if that's required. We can see here that the first step in this process is to raise up Millie's head and to pack out underneath with, um, with pillows, blankets, whatever you have at hand. Uh, so that we raise her, um, her ear up to the level of her sternum. We then extend her neck until the plane of her face becomes parallel with the ceiling. And we call this the sniffing position. Sometimes the patient's anatomy might prevent you from achieving that optimal sniffing position and you might need to um, put some padding underneath the shoulders as well in a process that we call ramping 
And while it's good to practice one method and master that, we also have to remember that all patients are different and what works for one may not work for another. And we see here that Millie, uh, when she's positioned in a ramped position, gives us a uh, fair, far better alignment of our three airway axes. So this works for her. So this concludes my first skill video on airway assessment and patient positioning.